Welcome, my beautiful people, to another episode of Dino Basics, where we dig up the basics on some of our favorite deceased beasts. My name is Logan, and today, we look into the basics on the bringer of dread for anyone with a bad case of megalophobia. Th that's the fear of anxiety of large objects, like th those really tall buildings, or like those images of big boats from weird ang- whatever. It's Dreadnoughtus. The earliest remains of Dreadnoughtus were discovered during an excavation led by American paleontologist Kenneth Lacovara in 2005, taking place in the Cerro Fortaleza Formation in the Santa Cruz province of modern-day Argentina. As a large sauropod, the bones of this creature were massive, making recovery extremely difficult for Lacovara and his team. Due to the remote location of the excavation site, his team would have to utilize ropes and mules to tow the fossils to a truck, with these fossils then being shipped off by an ocean freighter before finally being transported to the Academy of Natural Sciences of Drexel University in Philadelphia, Pennsylvania, where formal analysis could finally be done. This original fossil of Dreadnoughtus was remarkably complete for a sauropod, consisting of jaw fragments, a various assortment of ribs and vertebrae, as well as the fragmented remains of forelimbs and hindlimbs, among others. Looking at this diagram, this skeleton may seem fairly incomplete, but it is important to note for many dinosaurs, complete specimens or even relatively complete specimens are exceptionally rare due to their large size resulting in higher risks of scavengers cutting up their carcasses and moving their bones away from their places of death, or their large size limiting their entire bodies from being covered in sediment, disrupting the fossilization process. But scientists are still able to determine a lot from even limited fossil records. Heck, paleontologists have been able to reconstruct dinosaurs on even less data, like Argentinosaurus, for instance. And you think that's bad? Look at Puertasaurus. A few missing neck bones aren't looking too bad now, huh? The name Dreadnoughtus is an interesting one, as the name was chosen for two reasons. One was for translation. Unlike many dinosaurs that have had their names stem from ancient Greek or Latin, Dreadnoughtus was actually named based on the English language, being divided into the words dread and naught, which can be read as fears nothing. This name alludes to its believed inability to be hunted when at full size, that their sheer mass as adults make them impervious to predation by any carnivores of their time. The name also alludes to Dreadnoughts, a 20th century battleship class regarded for their sheer power and dominance, virtually impervious to attacks from ships that came before them not unlike how Dreadnoughtus would be immune to attacks from smaller predators. It is also likely this reference of Dreadnoughts could be a nod to the nation of origin for this creature, Argentina, as their navy would sport two such Dreadnoughts, the Rivadavia and the Moreno, throughout the early 20th century. Currently, there is only one species of this creature, that being the Dreadnoughtus shrani, Shrani was chosen in honor of American entrepreneur Adam Schron, who provided financial support for this original excavation that resulted in the fossils of Dreadnoughtus. As previously mentioned, Dreadnoughtus was a sauropod, a grouping of incredibly large herbivores that first appeared in the early Jurassic, and would go on to be some of the largest and most successful dinosaurs of all time. More specifically, Dreadnoughtus was a member of the Titanosauria, a subset of sauropods that are often considered the last of these long-necked dinosaurs, as this group would survive until the end of the Cretaceous, nearly 66 million years ago. Titanosaurs were some of the largest land animals to ever live, including members such as the 100-foot or 30-meter-long Patagotitan, or the 115-foot or 35-meter-long Argentinosaurus. Like other titanosaurs, Dreadnoughtus was exceptionally large. Estimates place the creature at nearly 85 feet or 26 meters in length, and would be nearly 20 feet or 7 meters tall at the shoulder. 
its neck, nearly 37 feet, or 11 meters alone, could help this creature reach even higher. Exactly how much height is a topic we'll get into in a moment. Determining the weight for such a creature has been a difficult prospect. The original description for this creature estimated Dreadnoughtus to weigh an astounding 59 tons, nearly eight and a half times as much as a male African elephant. However, others have criticized the means for how this weight was determined, instead arguing the weight was more likely far less, at about 40 tons instead. Without additional specimens to compare to, unfortunately the safest conclusion would be to assume the creature would fall within this wide range. Whether it be this 40 or 60 tons, at the time of its discovery, some sources claim Dreadnoughtus to be the largest terrestrial dinosaur ever discovered. And this is technically true. While there was evidence of possibly larger creatures, such as fellow South American Titanosaur Argentinosaurus, their lacking skeletal evidence make determining realistic size estimates difficult and, frankly, unreliable. So a more accurate title for Dreadnoughtus would be, quote, the largest dinosaur by weight we can realistically calculate with fossil evidence, but more likely smaller than other dinosaurs with fragmentary remains. But I guess that wasn't as catchy on a magazine cover. Also, uh, about five years later, a nearly complete skeleton of Patigo Titan would be discovered that's even larger than Dreadnoughtus. So even if you want to pull the whole complete skeleton argument, Dreadnoughtus was now at best second place, but shh, don't, don't tell them. He, they need this. While it might not be the largest, the extensive remains of Dreadnoughtus have informed scientists on what this creature, and by extension other titanosaurs, were like in life. While no complete skull of this creature has been recovered, if it is anything like its sauropod brethren, it was likely fairly small in comparison to the rest of its body. The jaws of Dreadnoughtus would likely be lined with hundreds of small, pencil-like teeth, which, while fairly ineffective at chewing, made them excellent for stripping branches of vegetation. It is more likely Dreadnoughtus would rely on gastroliths, or stomach stones, and specialized bacteria in their stomachs to process the leaves they would consume. This plant material would have to travel down their incredibly long neck, a common staple of sauropods, but even more so for Dreadnoughtus. The neck of Dreadnoughtus would make up nearly half of their entire body length, and based on the diameter of one vertebrae, could have been almost a meter or three feet in width. It's likely this neck was a unique evolutionary advantage for sauropods and especially titanosaurs over other herbivores of their time. This long neck could help Dreadnoughtus reach vegetation inaccessible to many smaller herbivores, allowing them to avoid competition with its more vertically challenged neighbors. A common question for these long necks is how they would be orientated on these gigantic creatures. And unfortunately, the answer is not a straightforward one. Scientists for years have debated how the neck of sauropods would be positioned on their enormous bodies with some arguing many would have their necks run horizontal to the ground, or arguing they would be raised more vertically from their bodies, or possibly somewhere in between these two orientations. The lack of complete sauropod skeletons, even for Dreadnoughtus, have made this difficult to determine, not to mention the many number of other factors that would play into this, such as blood pressure, metabolic rate, leg construction, tail counterbalancing, and muscle makeup, just to name a few. But there are other areas of Dreadnoughtus that could provide some hints into this area, such as their posture. Dreadnoughtus, as well as many other titanosaurs, held their bodies in what's called a wide gauge posture. In very simple terms, meaning their legs would be farther apart from one another and spaced further away from the midline of their bodies. This posturing was often seen in later sauropods of the Cretaceous, as well as some late Jurassic sauropods, such as Brachiosaurus. Based on this leg positioning, reconstructions, such as those done by Lacovara, 
illustrate Dreadnought is with a neck that extends more vertically than narrow-gauged sauropods such as Diplodocus. However, it also extends more horizontally than reconstructions of other wide-gauge sauropods like Brachiosaurus, largely due to their forelimbs and hindlimbs being of similar height, unlike Brachiosaurus with considerably longer forelimbs, allowing for more verticality. Dreadnoughtus would have lived during the late Cretaceous, about 70 million years ago. Fossils indicate it likely would have lived throughout modern-day southern South America, particularly countries like Argentina. Analysis of sediment from this time show evidence of volcanic activity throughout the ecosystem of Dreadnoughtus, creating vast empty plains for this creature to traverse intercut by lush forests thriving in the warm, humid climate, occasionally marred by seasonal arid times. If Dreadnoughtus was anything like its fellow sauropods, it is likely Dreadnoughtus would have lived in herds throughout their lives, largely for protection of themselves and their young. Like its Bodhi namesake, at full size Dreadnoughtus was essentially immune to predation. Although, like, nothing really eats a boat. They prefer subs. <laughs> <laughs> the original specimen of Dreadnoughtus did contain theropod teeth among the bones, connected to the Megaraptoran Orcoraptor. But this was likely evidence of scavenging over predation. Some of the largest native carnivores of the time, such as the Carnotaurus or Alcasaurus, likely posed no threat to this enormous titan. However, it is likely these carnivores could hunt their young or even sub-adults. Sauropods are certainly in no short supply in modern media. I guess you could say they're in... tall supply? <laughs> <laughs> But because of this, Dreadnoughtus has often been overlooked by its larger and more recognizable family members, like the Brachiosaurus or Argentinosaurus. Still, Dreadnoughtus has been able to receive a bit of attention on its own. It has appeared multiple times across the Jurassic Park franchise, as early as the 2012 video game Jurassic Park Builder, in later video games like 2019's Jurassic World Evolution, as well as its 2021 sequel, and in 2022's film Jurassic World Dominion. Beyond this, Dreadnoughtus has appeared in the 2022 documentary Prehistoric Planet, which highlights the possibility of air sacs along their necks, and in 2023's video game Ark Survival Ascended, which would clearly choose to highlight the beauty and prestige such a magnificent creature would embody. Wait, what, what's the vomit cannon? Claiming any title among dinosaurs is often a contentious task, whether it be the smallest, the earliest, the deadliest, or in this case, the biggest. While Dreadnoughtus has unfortunately lost this last crown, which was largely held on a technicality, but I digress. It does not take away from the incredible strength and magnificence this creature still wields. Dreadnoughtus is certainly a wonder to behold and an opponent to fear, boasting exceptional size and significant stature. You would certainly be a fool to not dread angering this beast. <laughs> wait, 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 no, no, no! You know you can just click the dislike button. It's making the same point. That's gonna do for this episode. Thank you so much for watching and I hope you enjoyed. Be sure to leave a comment below what you think of Dreadnoughtus and if you've heard of this dinosaur before the video. I'll be frank, half the reason I chose this creature is for how cool that name is. Dreadnoughtus. Sounds like some C-list Marvel villain, I love it. Next time, we explore the basics on the headache of a lineage that is Stenonicosaurus, which may have also involved Latena Venetrix, but is also including Troodon. We'll talk about it then. Thank you for your support, and see you in the next video.